Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will begin our book session. Good afternoon, or good day to those online as well. Welcome to Lila. Those that are new to the space, um, Huma is a space concerned with uh, African scholarship or scholarly research in, on, in and on the African continent. So, welcome. Today, this is our book lunch session. We have book lunch sessions every Monday and a range of other seminars, such as the entire interdisciplinary, sem interdisciplinary seminar. Um, you may check them out on our website. My name is Minet Lindlewit, and I will be chairing your session. I am a doctoral fellow at HUMA, part of HUMA's uh, flagship project, Future Hospitals. And today I have the pleasure of hosting this session and welcoming esteemed uh, Professor Owen Hoban, uh, and Oma Lina Adolf. Uh, Professor Colin Owen is a filmmaker. She's an award winning storyteller and teacher with a Pan African and global experience. Um, she will be presenting her book uh, today, The Keeper of the Kum Ancestral Belonging and Belonging of the Bruce Mankind. I hope I've said that correctly. Hint, my apologies. Um, so Professor is a, she's a, she has a background in journalism and she is appointed at the University of Johannesburg as the first ever, excuse me, the first ever pro professor of practice. And the book in question is based on the creative nonfiction novel, also of the same name. And uh, it was the opening of the 2016 National Arts Festival in Grahamstown, South Africa. This book tells a story of her life and how it's been, and it's been turned upside down by uh, an ancestor, Babo, a Bushman storyteller and revolutionary. Uh, she writes of being too black for her colored schoolmates, working as one of the early women journalists in the misogynist 1970s during apartheid South Africa, and of the constant struggle to find an identity that fits. In this book, she also unearths a history that speaks to her first in the language of a long nameless illness without a conventional cure, and then in the calling of her ancestors. We're looking forward to hearing more about this book, Keep Up the Kum. Thank you so much, Professor, for coming to Huma and for uh, gracing us with your presence. Thank you, Omar, for coming as well. Uh, this is an open space. Uh, you, you're welcome to share more about the book, and um, we are happy to have an engagement um, in the next part of the session. Please note this is being live streamed onto Zoom. Uh, I mean, onto Facebook, and it's being recorded onto Zoom. Thank you. Gagans, Kai Gangans, Heitzes, greetings. First of all, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are holding this event on the traditional lands of the Khoikhoi and the Sun, First Nations of Southern Africa, and by acknowledging that. The traditional custodians of this land had no understanding or have no understanding of land belonging to people. The understanding is that we belong to the land. So we acknowledge the First Nations custodians of this land, and we also acknowledge our ongoing connections to our elders, past, present, and future. We also acknowledge our connections to our ancient cultures to the land, to the sea, and to community. And if Africa is the birthplace of humanity, then we are all children of the Koyakoyans. Just recently, we had a now ceremony, and for the Koyakoy people, the now is like um, comparative to the Nguni tradition of, of, or the Twasa tradition, rather, of Twasa. And it's a rite of passage which is done for young women, um, young people, but it is also done when there is an important transition in the life of a community and or of a person. And so the, the now that we had last week was for Kritoa, and it was the lead up to the renaming of the building at Stanbosch University to the Kritoa building. And Omalina Adolf, who is a healer, a gifted seer, 
And one of our elders, and especially as a powerful female elder, came all the way from Van Rainstorm to do this for Sakelo because in writing the book and in writing the subsequent play that I did about Kratoa, I found in the archives that Kratoa was never given the opportunity to do her now. And there is written in the archives about how the cattle for the festival, for the feasting, um, and for the slaughter, stood at the homestead of her sister and her brother-in-law. And for me, that was a very sad thing. And so we cannot move forward until we elevate our ancestors in this way. So starting with the, with the title of the book, um, The Keeper of the Kum, Ancestral Longing and Belonging of a Wuslankan. The title is very deliberately in three different languages because one of the biggest uh, challenges that we face as Southern Africans and especially as First Nations South Africans is the aggressive historic removal of language, the removal and destruction of names and culture and identity. And when you've removed people's indigenous names, when you've taken away their language, when you've destroyed their culture, you've basically gone 90% of the way to destroying them in themselves. And what we're seeing at the moment with the book and with various other initiatives around us is a revival, a, a, a going back into history to go and fetch those things that we've lost. The West Africans talk very eloquently and beautifully about the Sankofa moment. And the Sankofa bird that some of you would know is that mythical bird um, that appears in West African um, folklore. Uh, and the image is of a bird that is turned around with its beak retrieving a gemstone on the back. And that is literally what we are engaging in as South Africans and what this book is part of, is to return to the past, to, to um, restore to our current selves and to our current cultures and communities the, the dignity of what we, we have been stripped of and what we have been lost. And so in the title, the kum is a kum word, and kum is now extinct language of the Northern Cape Bushmen. And it means story or account or anything told and retold. And um, the, the subtitle Ancestral Longing and Belonging of a Busman Kind um, is my connection to the main character in the story, Pablo, whose, whose picture is, is on the front cover. Um, and I explain that in the book. And um, the, the word Wismankent is, is kind of interesting because when I was growing up, there were three racial insults that you could call people that were just, it was the worst thing you could call them, you could call them all, which is the, um, the colonial kind of term for all of the, the Kwe Kwe people. Or you could call them a busman, which again was the translation of a colonial word um, for the sun people because of the lifestyle, the very simplistic lifestyle that they had. They were known as bush people. Um, and what is interesting about it is that in recent times, um, this particular word bushman or busman has been reclaimed by people. And if you go especially into the, the Northern Cape and the Kalahari, um, there's one Bushman leader that I went and spent some time with. And when he meets you, the first thing he says is, Ekus Peter Svalboy, a Bushman van the Kalahari, me a son. I'm Peter Peter Svalboy, a Bushman of the Kalahari, and there's no such thing as son. So, so these terms are contested and they are extremely difficult, but for the purposes of this event and for the purposes of getting on with discussion and conversation in life in general, we choose them um, and we choose the ones that we are the most comfortable with. And Bushman people are saying that that sun is not something that describes anything, you know, it's it, original meaning just means the people without, the people without things. And to make them stand out, say from the Kwekwe who were pastoralists and, and, and herders. Um, and so the, the reclaiming of that word 
is reflective of a much, much broader movement of people who are re-examining their history and re-examining their identity and understanding very, very clearly that in order to lay claim to this land, in order to belong in the landscape of our history, you can't belong there calling yourself colored. The moment you call yourself colored, you strip yourself of your identity, your culture, your history, your language and everything. And so going into the book, I won't recount too much of what is written, but except to say that I've written it in three different parts. Hello, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> I've written it in three different parts. Um, the first part is called Mixed, and that deals with my early upbringing in, in um, Cape Town. And it's really heartwarming to see somebody whom I spent my early years with, Nuran. <laughs> We were little babies together, children together, growing up, same primary schools throughout, um, even before primary school, playing together. And so the part called Mixed is because of the fact that when I was born in the 50s, there were no refined racial categories here. So uh, people where I came from were placed in this category called Mixed. So my birth certificate says Mixed colored and cake colored and cake filet and all of those other things came, came much later. And the middle part of the book is, is, um, is called, I just have to get it right. Yeah, the middle part of the book, I use the, the problematic term colored <clears throat> to put that label on it because that is a label that defined my young years, defined my growing up. You went to a colored primary school, a colored high school, you lived in a, in a colored neighborhood and you thought of yourself as colored. And that wasn't just a, a word, it, it meant a lot of things. It meant a certain kind of land rights, it meant certain kind of work rights. It, it also played into certain kind of um, colorism and prejudices around hair and skin and nose. And, all kinds. It was a very, very complex thing. And, and without knowing it as a child, you are negotiating this landscape as you're growing up and you are internalizing it. And then very thankfully, um, as, a, as a high school person at, at a, a great high school in, in the Cape, in, in, in South, at South Peninsula, we had an incredible collection of, of teachers and so black consciousness, when it came, um, you know, seeped into our, our awareness, was welcomed, contextualized, explained by these teachers. And so the third part of the book is called Black, the discovery of black consciousness and what it does at a very, very deep level to my understanding of myself and identity. And the, the last part of the book is called Khoisan. And, and I know that Khoisan is a problematic term because people prefer to identify with either Khoi Khoi or San or Bushman. Um, but if you read the book, you'll, you'll understand more that I feel very strongly I have um, historic and spiritual connections with um, Tabo and, and Bushman people. And then in the present time, because of my mother and grandmother's connections, my grandmother comes from the Hesekwa people of the Overberg, specifically Swarandan region. And, and so that is the, the Khoi Khoi connection. So, so the, um, the, the, the Khoi San word is a kind of um, code switching word, you know, it's kind of mixing things. And, and I, I, I kind of like that because I don't know a single South African who sticks to one language for the entire conversation. It is really hard and it speaks to who we are and it's extremely important to acknowledge. So those are the, um, the three sections of the book, how the book was written. And let me just see by kind of simple show of hands, has anybody read it so that I don't go into too much boring detail? One, two, three. Okay, three bits of it. And, and maybe online, if people can give us an indication, just online, it would be nice. Um, so how it came to be written is, and, and how the um, subtitle Ancestral Longing and Belonging um, fits into everything, 
is that I've always been a, a journalist, a media person, and, and I started out as a print journalist and then gravitated towards uh, television with the um, crossover from the old South Africa to the new in the 90s, 93, 94, and going to work at the SNBC when it became possible to do that in more good conscience. And so that meant a life of, of really running around madly, not really having time to get to know yourself. And covering the, the dying years of apartheid was extremely traumatic, extremely stressful. For, and at that stage, towards the mid 80s and early 90s, I was working for mostly foreign, foreign media houses. And at the, at the time when I became seriously, seriously ill, I was out of the country working on a media project in West Africa, specifically in Ghana, living in Accra, but traveling around West Africa and training journalists working in media development mainly. Um, and it was a job for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So by all accounts, for me anyway, this was my dream job. I had a fantastic life. I had everything I wanted, all the resources to do a really good. Please come inside and come and sit down. Um, to do, these are just some sisters who were part of the whole uh, crypto last week and part of doing the now. Um, you can either sit the side, just grab two chairs, or you can sit over that seat. Um, and so th this dream job for, for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but I was just getting steadily more and more ill, and I was having to fly back to South Africa to get tests done because having things done in Ghana was a little bit difficult. And then I would see a different specialist and get something and be okay for a while and go back and carry on with my work. But it just got worse and worse and worse until I was completely debilitated. I, I had to go and do some training in the north of, of Ghana one day and I had a driver who drove me there. Throughout the whole journey, I could just about lie down in the back seat. I could hardly sit up, I was so ill. And I got there, did the training, went back into the car, went to lie in the back seat and he drove me home. And I thought, well, this can't continue. And when all the specialists I uh, consulted, all the doctors that I went to, it cost me tens of thousands of rand for explorations, operations that I opened up and looked and couldn't find anything. Um, all of them just said they don't know what's wrong and, and the symptoms were very, um, I couldn't eat, I couldn't hold food down, um, headaches, body aches, pains, um, my immune system was going down. And the, the common diagnosis that I would get from one specialist to the other is that they can only assume that it's chronic fatigue, chronic fatigue, because at that stage, this was in the um, 2008, 2009 started, chronic fatigue was kind of a fashionable medical thing and they were confused. And so luckily for me, I had a friend at that stage but before that happened, I had to give up the job in Ghana. And I just, I, I remember the morning when I decided to do that, I opened the front door and it was early in the morning because the driver to fetch me to go to the um, radio station where I was based was standing in front of me at the door. And when I opened the door, that tropical sun just kind of hit me. I couldn't keep my eyes open. My eyes were hurting from the sun. And I had to ask him to come inside very quickly so I could close the door. And going out there to the sun was really, really hard. And that morning, I decided I went to the radio station, said goodbye to everybody, cut all my ties, and said, I'm really very, very ill. And went home and wrote to the Gates Foundation and said, I'm getting on the next plane back to South Africa. Um, you know, and as it is when you make these big decisions, everything just came together. I had no home yet. I packed up all my stuff and I was going to be there for many years. Um, and a friend of me, mine offered me a cottage in Betis Bay um, that was just standing there. They lived in England. And so I went straight there. And soon after I got back from Ghana, um, I saw a friend who is also a very, very gifted CEO, has great, great powers. And she said to me, 
there is something your ancestors want you to do. And this is not an ordinary sickness and you'll stop going to ordinary doctors. You have to go and see a son woman. And that was the conversation that just turned my whole life around. I was brought up as a Seventh-day Adventist and in our house, we didn't even say the word something. was not something up for discussion. And traditional healers were just not recognized at all, never ever discussed. So this was the first time I went to a sun woman. And like my friend had said, he took one look at me and he says, your ancestors are speaking to you very, very loudly. And if you, you can continue to ignore it, but you will just get sicker and sicker. And if you don't do what has been required of you, you will die because this is your purpose. And if you're not fulfilling your purpose, and I, I remember just hearing at that time, there are two reasons why you die. The one is, that you have now fulfilled your purpose, you are complete to this place and you can move on. And the other reason why you die is that you're not fulfilling your purpose. And, and so that was the kind of wake up call. And then I started writing the book and writing the book. I had no idea what I was writing in the beginning. I was just writing things that kind of came out for me. But what it has, has led me to understand at a very visceral level is that Certain kind of creative stories choose you. You do not choose the story. And the story comes from a very powerful place and it has a power of its own. And you have to make yourself available to the story. You have to make yourself available and be guided by where the story is going. And what happens then is that you are led to a creative ability which is beyond the intellect. And I know that it's really hard, especially in this kind of environment, to understand that the true creativity lies way beyond your intellect and how you access it is extremely important. And the process of this book, and we can talk about that process more if you would like to, taught me almost in a kind of scientific way how to access that inner creativity that is required to not just write this, but to write the kinds of things that I have written since then. Because the it's a kind of creativity that is very, very different to, to the ordinary everyday stuff that you are calling on. But also it's it's good that we're having this conversation so long after the book was published. The book was published in um, 2016 at the same time as a dance drama, drama of the same name opened at the Grandstand Festival. And since 2016, yes, the, the book was a huge turning point. The working with Sangomas in this way, I still visit the same Sangoma. I still work with him in, in, in a similar way. Um, has changed my life around. But that change isn't static. It's just not something that happened then and now and finally things was on. Um, it, is, it is like the best um, comparison I can have is, is like falling pregnant, especially for the first time. You have no idea what you're getting yourself in for. And it slowly kind of reveals itself. And as the child grows up, you realize my, my son turned 14 um, a few years ago. And I remember reflecting on his 40th birthday that this thing of mothering never stops. It just goes on and on forever. So in the same way, this giving birth to, to a, um, a creative story and a creative nonfiction story that has been driven in this way by an ancestral process leads to other processes. And that just never end, and that become more and more powerful. So, in a way, the the keep of the kum became like an extended prologue for what for what has happened since. And the um, the Kratoa process that that we mentioned earlier is is also part of that. And writing the book, I also realized that I'm not writing this book for myself. Um, Sorry, I'm not writing this book for an audience. I'm not writing this book to be for sales or to be read or to be critiqued or to be recognized. I'm writing this book primarily for myself. And at one stage, I remember when I was sitting in this cottage at the seaside in Betty's Bay, I was extremely lonely and very sick. And sometimes I would just get so miserable with the whole process, I'd stop the writing process and then I'd get worse. And then it became like almost a little game. I could 
this can't be. I mean, well, this is so unscientific. What the hell is this all about? And then I would start writing again, and I'd be remarkably better. And then a couple of weeks of that, and I think, okay, I'm going to go into Cape Town now and spend some time with my friends. And I would be able to do that for a day or two. But if I carry on for longer than that, I would be back where I started. And and which means I would be able to have the strength to get up for about half a day. And by lunchtime, I can hardly walk anymore. And I have to go back to bed. So I was like semi-bedridden, but at least half of the day I could get up and do little things. And then for the rest of the day, I would be in bed. And so I got really kind of down at some stage of the process. And I was I was kind of asking these questions into the wind. This loneliness is a little bit too much, you know. People were almost like being kept at bay. And, and I remember sitting in front of my computer and this sentence just came and said, we isolate one to reach many. And I thought, wow, that makes a lot of sense. So I've since discovered that whenever, when I've written the book, this happened, and when I wrote the crypto play, this happened. And now that I have started, I'm busy uh, at the um, Stellenbosch, Inter Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies, Dias. Uh, on a fellowship there to write a book about Kritoa, of which the Kritoa now was part of that process. Same kind of isolation happens. Things just get cut off, kept at bay, because it's an isolation that puts you into a frame of mind, a state of being that allows your ancestors to work with you more with less interruptions, less interference from the craziness of the world out there. And and these stories then become um, openings for me to a state of expanded awareness. But those openings and, and the work that comes out of that also then becomes available to, to people to assist other people to expand their own awareness about, around the role of ancestors, the role of, of spirit in our lives and, and how we have to work in harmony with these things. Um, so yes, so, so, so bringing, I mean, there are many reasons why we tell stories, but all of us tell stories to bring understanding. And for me, this was primarily to bring understanding for myself so that I could help others understand. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of stop there. I had prepared a few other points, um, but I think that could come out in, in discussion. Um, Yeah, let's just see what else I, I think I'd like to say before I finish. Yes, I think one of, one of the most important things I'd like to say before we, we start a, a more general discussion is that a deep realization for me has been the role of ritual, but also writing as a ritual, writing and ritual, writing as ritual. And as modern people, we tend to Kind of brush our teeth every day. And that's about it for ritual. And I have come to understand that I don't do regular rituals, very specific rituals, of which the, the now was probably the most powerful ritual I've ever been involved in. Then it it my my life lacks quality, lacks texture. I also have great difficulty accessing my creativity and I have great difficulty hearing what my ancestors are saying and interpreting those messages so that they can end up as words on a page. Um, and so what ritual does is it, it helps me to have that seamless connection between the past and the present, between my ancestors and their guidance and what the work I do and the impact of that work. And as such, it is important, you will notice if you read the book, that for me to write in the present tense, because I think this separation of the past and the present and the future is a very foreign thing for Africans. We see the past as part of the present and we see the future as part of the present. And so I write always in the present tense to, to remind myself of how important that is. Um, yeah, I'm going to end by just reading a little bit from this, and it is it is a part of the book where I um, quote from the archive where Prabhu is telling the 
Lucy Lloyd, who, um, who is responsible, partly responsible for the Blake Lloyd archive. Uh, brother-in-law William Blake came here as a philologist, a linguist, and she was his um, assistant and translator. And they worked together with Tabo and various other teacher informants to produce this archive. And Tabo writes and he says, and I have just adapted his words um, in, in this, this piece. A Bushman let, Bushman's letters are inside our flesh. These letters talk, they quiver and tap. They move, they make our bodies move. A dream is that which deceives, it cheats. The kwe is that which speaks truly. It is the kum that stirs and taps and quivers. We carry our letters, our stories in our bodies. Our stories talk, they quiver, they tap. Our letters make our bodies move. Our stories make our people silent. In the silence, we feel the tapping inside. My flesh moves, my body shakes, drums beating, wings flapping, the queer deep inside. A dream speaks falsely, it's a thing that deceives. The queer speaks truly, it's a thing that receives. It stirs the kum for people to come. We sense the rain to find the game. We feel in this moment, we feel a sensation. I hear it whisper soft like my breath. To the tune of my heart, I follow the kum. Like a story in a book, the quiet touches my ribs. The springbok are coming, I say to the children. The black hair of the springbok is here at my side. When a woman comes, I feel on my shoulders the pull of the thong holding her child. Before the hunt, my legs know springbok blood in the soft place behind my knee. My back knows, when, my back knows springbok hairs on my skin. We are wont to wait quietly when the feeling comes. We feel in this manner, we feel a sensation. Our letters, our stories in our bodies. My feet tell me the springbok is running, rustling the bushes. My head tells me the horns are coming. On my face is the feel of a strike, from my head to my nose. My eyes have become springbok's eyes. We feel in this manner, we feel a sensation. Our letters, our stories, in our bodies. Gangans, Kaisa Gangans, thank you very much. Titage Amibahe Hage Abaratake. My name is Mibahe Hage, one who is told and one who came on the pathway of the horses. Thank you so much, Professor. That was very beautiful, um, very visceral. And um, I'd like to invite anyone virtually or in the room, if you have any comments, questions, um, any reflections on, on, on the presentation or the book, if you've read it. I, I see a hand, Ahmed. Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Mine will be um, more reflections. Ahmed, would you mind turning your mic? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Speaking, the speaking identity is. Uh, okay. yeah, speaking on identity politics is not easy and it's very hard. Sometimes it becomes more sensitive, even, especially in South Africa. I would like to um, use the definition of Frederick Barthes of ethnicity, while he discusses ethnicity is not a cultural stuff. It is determined by territorial demarcations. And I think he has the point. When you look at established identities across Africa, as Paul Zeleza argues, most of national identities in Africa being constructed 
by colonialism. Follow up to uh, um, Zeleza's points, I would like to raise some issues and some points based on your book. First, the issue of coloredness, which is very much questioned uh, through the book and which also resonates with uh, some of South African scholars' work. Uh, I think um, Mohammed Edekhari comes to my mind while uh, where he discusses the color, the identity of color is construct of colonialism and later became a very static category in racial configuration of apartheid regime between superiority and inferiority. And I think it is very important that to bring this into the discussion. And I think the idea of that colored became very problematic since, since the arrival of uh, Europeans in southern, uh, southern Africa. If you look at fictions, travel accounts, notes, narratives, archives, you, you will see how this idea of color being constructed uh, through uh, the discourse. Uh, I give you one example from Olive Schreiner's novel, uh, a story of an African father. You know, Olive Schreiner has been championed by South African, prominent South African writers for her liberal and democratic values. In, in that novel, she, she describes colored, colored people as a half caste people who are not able to think, who are not able to make decisions. Even she goes, Far, calling them offer, which you also mentioned that, that uh, discriminative, pejorative word. And as you you know, copper in during the colonial time became a very uh, characteristic discourse to to define the to define people of color, not just color, and even you know black and colored people. If you, if you read you know, African-American literature, this word since the beginning has been used to, to define uh, and describe, describe the other. And this uh, also, I mean, the other colonial writers, I, I don't want to name them. Uh, the second uh, thing, I, second issue I would like to uh, address is about the process of healing. And it's amazing to see how you bring animist practices into, into the life, into life. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's kind of process, I, I read it as a process of mourning, you know, which is exercised through that uh, healing, through uh, ancestry, ancestry calling. And I think every time when we speak on mourning, uh, we have to do justice to Freud as well. We have to remember the, the concept of mourning and melancholy. You know, he uh, simply just put, you know, he says, if you don't mourn and you're dead, you will be in a trouble. But here is, we can translate it to the context of, of your book. You know, let's say, if you're not if you don't mourn the past, the, the history, the anxieties generated through apartheid regime, you will be much in trouble and in state of, in state of uh, melancholy. The third will be my critic. And since this is a very personal uh, account, and you already mentioned that all, we all come from, come from uh, you know, uh, sun, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the children of sun. Yeah. It, it, it ends with a very sounding note. Let me read it. If Africa is the birthplace of all humanity, then we are all children of the sun. And you also mentioned, you know, repeatedly. <laughs> and I think this um, contradicts with the way, you know, you deconstruct the idea of colorness. You know, this, uh, this ending might be a little bit problematic and even 
nowadays it has been challenged a lot, you know, uh, and also it might be found as kind of essentialist, you know, a discourse. And uh, I wonder how you elaborate such uh, renderings of the book. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, do you mind just turning your microphone off? Do you want to answer the question? Yes, I, I'll just go through some of the points that you raised um, in no particular order. Thanks, thanks for that, Ahmed. Um, yes, I don't think we need to address territorial demarcations in, in terms of identity because we all in this room are, I assume, agree that historic territorial, territorial demarcations are problematic and came from outside of, of our control. And if I just look at Southern Africa, for instance, um, um, here is both a Namibian and a South African and, you know, um, inside myself, as I said earlier, my spiritual historic connections are, are Bushmen, um, my immediate connections via my matrilineal lineage is Kwekwe, my patrilineal lineage is via the, the slaves who were brought from Indonesia and Malaysia, um, and then there is what I identify as, so I think all of those are, you know, are a given. And yes, it's very complex. But I think as, as modern people, we this is the, the point of all of these discussions that we are having, the things that are being written. Um, coloredness is an essentially painful thing to address. And it's painful because there are conversations that are not being had. And it's it's painful, and 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 I think it's a conversation that is very difficult for you to to see as as an outsider. But at the same time, there's a lot of value in your observations as an outsider because you can see things in a way that we can't can't see on the inside. And I'll just mention a few of the things why coloredness is painful. And apart from the obvious that that it, it disconnects you from your spiritual ancestry, it disconnects you from your history, it disconnects you from the land, it takes away your right of ownership. Um, and it has a deep effect on people ideologically, emotionally, intellectually, um, and, and just on, on so many respects. But the other, the other painful things we are not discussing enough as South Africans is why is there this emotional clinging to the identity of coloredness. Why is it so strong that people want to hold on to it? And, and I have, and these are just my own suppositions, and from what I feel and see around me in the way that I grew up, it is really difficult to get rid of the depth of the ingrained nature of the colonial understanding of ourselves. We are sitting here, we are talking in a colonial language. We are sitting in a colonial institution with colonial ways of framing knowledge, with colonial um, um, manners of scholarship, um, an entire millennia that is dictated from outside of Africa. And within this difficult environment, within these difficult dictates, within this disabled language, we have to come to some sort of agreement of who we are. And so the, the coloredness that people cling to is because they still see this, this kind of colonial configuration as being superior to the alternative that is being held up for them. So if, if they are you're being told, well, the alternative is that you are koi koi, the alternative is that you are koringai kwa, that you are hesa kwa, that you are otani kwa, or that you are bushman, or worst of all. There is no cachet, there is no power, there is no understanding of a spiritual connection, of a historic connection, but it goes deeper than that. The other thing that we are not discussing here is the ancient hurt that people sit with, the ancient battles, the aggression, that went into exterminating thousands and thousands of Kwekwe people, of Nama people, of Herrera people, of Obama people, that aggression and who were the, were the protagonists in those aggressive um, encounters. In a lot of those aggressive encounters, 
they were um, the interaction wasn't just between the, the First Nations people and the colonials. There were black aggressors on either side. And so when you go to certain parts of the country, people tell stories like it's something being ripped out of their hearts, not so much about the colonial aggression, but about the, the suffering that they had at the hands of people who came from other parts of Africa at, at this time. All of those things are finding themselves in our modern discourse, in our modern social interaction as racism, as, as, as um, um, xenophobia, and as various other things. And it is, it is very glib to say that the people who hang on to, to coloredness who want this mixed identity rather than a firm African identity, um, it's very easy to say that they that the subtext is racism. The subtext is a whole lot of things. The subtext is extremely complex and it differs from person to person and sometimes it differs from conversation to conversation. So I'm, I'm just going to, to end that section of my response to you by saying, I don't have the solution, but I have lots of observations. And, and I'm prepared to say that it is so complex that it is something that we could have had this entire session just around the issue of coloredness. And it's different from the Creoles of other parts of the world, or the Mestizos of other parts of the world, where the, the political baggage and the historic baggage isn't as heavy as it is here. Um, but the ancient herd is something that we that we need to discuss and that we need to, to address. But coming back to this, this um, discussion then in a different way, we still have an obsession with definitions and groupings. And, uh, you know, I just think that um, part of my own healing and healing as opposed to psychiatry, you know, I, I, I think I was fortunate that for a very long time, I went the regular mainstream route of mainstream psychiatry so that I could say from an informed place, that it sucks. And for an African with, with um, struggling with the issues that a lot of us as Africans struggle with, mainstream psychiatry is adding to the problem on most days. Um, but the, the thing is that when, when we are in this process of healing, and I just found this myself, and so I'm going to answer it in a very personal way, I found that moving away from that obsession of group identity and, and some kind of ethnic tribal identity was important. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that I'm moving away from my history. It doesn't mean that I'm moving away from a part of my identity. It meant that I can see my identity more clearly. My identity is primarily African. It's secondly as a South African black woman. And then down, further down the line, I identify as Khoi Khoi. I identify as a Khoi Khoi revivalist activist who is very concerned with the, the lack of literature, with the lack of stories that we've inherited. And I see my role very strongly as filling in the gaps in our archives and using all kinds of talents, both my more obvious talents and then more ethereal talents to fill in those gaps. So, um, and I don't see a necessary contradiction between those things. I think that um, getting lastly to your, your comment on, on essentialism in, in this whole discuss, discussion about about identity and groupings and where we belong and contradiction between us all being descended from common ancestry. Um, I don't see that as essentialist. I see that these discussions, especially the work that I do, is inspired for me and driven by a spiritual imperative primarily. And for me, the spiritual imperative is extremely important and, and uppermost. And because of that, it's my starting point. The oneness of humanity and the oneness of everything is my starting point. And then we have to 
because the universe is a complete paradox at every turn, we have to take on board the paradox of accepting the oneness while understanding our individual identities, accepting that my fingerprint is unique, but that myself and my sister here, my sister here, this group, everybody that in my community, that we are in in that that we are inextricably linked as one organism. Thank you so much, Paul, for that response. Um, does anyone in the room or virtually have a question to ask or a reflection that they'd like to share? We still have about 12 minutes. Uh, in the session, so you're welcome to Dominique. Thank you so much for taking me in. I think you for the fascinating uh, conversation and just kind of um, taking advantage of the answer uh, that I uh, noted like a difference between uh, queerness or like the complexity of, of what it is to be mixed and like the layers of also like trauma and violence uh, in this country. Or, uh, identity and like what you spoke to say about the but like a different coolness and I, I was just uh, curious about uh, about that so if you if you care about that, like just say a few more sentences about it but, you know. um sorry I just need to be clear I did I didn't quite get what what it is you wanted me to expand on so uh, just just at the end of your answer to to Ahmed you mentioned that um, you mentioned that I can't quote you totally exactly, but you said you said something like there's a lot of hurt um, and uh, that that go with that notion of business and that identity, and it's quite different from what realness is in other parts of the world. You know, I'm curious about, about that kind of comparison. Oh, okay, okay. Um, Good question. I, I, I'm just looking at this as um, just to be clear that it's it's not anything researched or studied, but it's just personal observations. So you know, the the, the one African country where I've lived a long time, um, longer than, than than anywhere else apart from South Africa, is is in West Africa. And yes, there are people in West Africa who are physically very mixed in their, in their physical appearance. But when you close your eyes and you listen to them interact, they are Ghanaian in the expression of themselves. Um, amongst my students in West Africa and colleagues and friends, there were lots of people who had mixtures in their immediate um, ancestry. Um, between colonial and African, and in some cases Asian, but they were essentially Ghanaian and in a very homogenous way they were Ghanaian. Um, you know, with yes, with some distinctions, social starter and accent and education, all of those, the normal things, but in the way they expressed themselves, um, they were, there was so little difference between people. In fact, I don't even think in the years that I lived in Ghana, I ever heard somebody say the word colored or use a similar word that relates to Ghanaians who are fair-skinned or, you know, who, who look different, who are, who are physically mixed. Um, so, yes, those, those groupings of people exist, but they are less defined. Nobody cares about the definition. Nobody even talks about the definition. Um, it was so interesting that when I came back here, when the first time I, I'd been back for a few months, and the first time I heard this kind of sense of debate about race and identity, I thought, my God, I missed this. I haven't heard it for years. Nobody does that and nobody cares. And and so that's that's what I meant, you know, um, and from my experience that a year when you are for me being colored has been a constant negotiation. There's sometimes, I remember one day I was traveling from Cape Town via Johannesburg to Swaziland. And at Cape Town airport, I ended up in an argument with somebody because they would refuse to speak to me in English. And I was saying in the little bit of Tosa that I, that I could summon, that I couldn't understand everything that was being asked of me. And in Johannesburg airport, I had a very similar argument with a Zulu man. 
And I had just arrived in Lebanon, went to a, a pharmacy, and the pharmacist insulted me for not speaking Siswati. And so I exploded. And I said, you know, I've had a whole day of this, and I've come thousands of kilometers. But that is, I'm just telling you the story, and that is just one day. You're constantly being challenged by a kind of language terrorism, first of all, and a kind of imperialism that is just there under the surface all the time. Especially, and I'm, I'm just going to have to say this, it is never worse than when I'm in the Western and Eastern Cape and KZN. Those two areas, I have to constantly explain myself all the time. And so, so yeah, there are so many layers to be to being colored. The, the politics is just like in your face all the time. And... Um, Putting this whole event, the Kratoa event at Sambash together, at Sambash University together this weekend, the tensions and the stresses amongst the different groupings who identify as this and who identify as that, and and the the blatant racism, you know, that was playing out on the surface. These things all speak to deep underlying historic issues that have not been addressed. And they sit there and they poison us individually and they poison our communities and our nation until we open them up like boils and lance and say, let it come out, let us see all that dirt, let us like speak about it, let us act it out, let us say what it is that we do about this other. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Can I just add one thing? Just, just as a yeah, sorry, I'm looking at you. Just to bring it up first. Uh, just, no, just to give context for what I'm, I was asking the question, is also because I'm working for a creole space, but I guess I am, and also it was at ABE, where actually I find resonances because there are actually like so much layers. There, for example, in Benin or in Nigeria, there are, there are, there are, there are like uh, communities of mixed people that are descendants of Brazilians and local population that are like repatriated. Um, uh, African and slave African, and also the Senate of slave traders. So, a lot of so that there's a lot of ethos in the kind of painful, painful net of negotiation language, like to possibly the local language, and then also, and, and I can also find that. So, he, uh, like, I would argue that behind, like, the like, some kind of kind of easy nature of queerness, everyone who born, you find a whole way of violence and like. Uh, their ancestry and those kind of negotiations that are very tasty, very elastic. So that's the whole Great, great. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And and I, I, I must say, as a peers, I found the Ghanaians especially peaceful, <laughs> especially compared with South Africans, but definitely also compared with other West Africans. <laughs> um, thank you for your talk, Sophia. <laughs> It was very sort of emotional and also um, it seems to be a theme of uh, emotional trauma from violence, colonial violence. It seems to be a theme that's becoming universal. Because I also read um, just last week, we went to see a play by the musician um, act, actress. Called Ill, where she, uh, I don't know if you've seen the play, where she also uh, tries to understand herself and goes back to what happened in the nations during the colonialism. And she is of the colonial stock, and how that affects her relationship with people in the nations. That was also very emotive. And then there's also in Canada, this woman who writes about birth through areas in Canada, a lot of First Nation people were adopted. Kids were ripped up to their homes and sent to boarding schools, and they lost all identity or adopted. So it's almost a universal theme of the addressing ancestral trauma. And um, I was just finding this, um, it's also a theme in Buddhism about people cannot go forward in Canada to address the domestic violence. So we're just coming back to the period where we as teachers don't see a lot of traumatic violence in classrooms. We, um, people, uh, kids can't 
focus for um, adult, I mean, adult education or when adults can't uh, move beyond because they still have to, um, you know, just get in touch with the ongoing violence. Because the violence is not just ancestral, I think it's ongoing. So I was just wondering how you see uh, the move from your work into the present to deal with uh, um, ongoing violence and what some people will call this project of justice. And uh, how do you um, bring that into a, a, a movement of, uh, of educators? We think about educating others, but people first have to unlearn some things or unpack some things before they can actually learn. Mm -hmm. So I just want to bring that, that That's a good question, and I suppose. The way I'll answer it is by saying, but first of all, there's a there's an interesting center at Stellenbosch University called run by um, Professor Pumla Gaborda Marikizela, and it's called the Center for the Afterlife of Violence and the Reparative Quest. Really amazing work that they're, they're doing there. And one of the ironies of that center is that one of Professor um, Pumla's assistants is Valella Prabhur. Who is the grandson of, of H. F. Brut? And I just think H. F. Brut was one of the architects of a prior change. And I think there's something playing out, you know, just, just in that. But in terms of, of um, ancestral trauma, there, there is such a clear understanding, especially in recent scholarship, that you know the trauma lives on in our, in our very DNA, that we that we perpetuate the trauma and the hurt and the violence that was done. To our ancestors, and how we deal with that is, you know, is is, is a huge question. Um, and then the education is is um, extremely important. So, so what we've been doing is, for instance, with the with the keep of the kum, it was important for us to also do the dance drum and to perform it and to perform it for audiences who can feel that formative nature of what we gain, what we're talking about. This whole issue of intellectual. Eurasia and epistemic wrongs that have been done here. Yeah. Um, but with the with the Kritua play, we went a little bit further. We had um, in, instead of just the, the play out there, we had huge workshops. So we had, for instance, at the Word Fest last year, we had 1,400 high school learners and students coming to see the play and then going into workshops. To, to workshop these, these issues that the play brings up about intellectual erasure and identity. And what we then did is we, we got them not just to write and talk, but we got them to perform little uh, um, instant dramas. We got them to do some, write some poems and rap. Some of them did clay sculptures, some of them did finger paintings and drawings. And all of what they produced is um, was also part of this event at the weekend, which is an now on an exhibition in the Silmarsh Museum, which, which opened at the, at the weekend, so that we're not just giving these youngsters the, the therapeutic healing tool of talking through things, of experiencing what the play is saying to them, of expressing themselves and giving them the dignity of having that expression heard in, in a very significant way. So, so that exhibition opened at the weekend and, and is running. Um, the entire process, the, the process with the play, those workshops that I'm talking about, is, is educational. Um, and then the process with, with, with Katoa, with the now, with the, the building rename, all of that, that's the next step of that is to make that available as an educational resource. And that is being um, kind of developed at the moment. We do be busy with the research. How do we make all of that available as a valuable resource, especially for us? Thank you. Um, yeah, question. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. I loved your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about process. And um, as someone you're based at a university, you're a professor at a colonial university, how you navigate that in terms of your creative work and also scholarship um do you see them intention i just you know i'm a creative writer but it's a scholar but i'm actually a storyteller who's pretending to be a scholar <laughs> um, 
and um, uh, and so like all of my work that I produce, I think it's from a storytelling. But how do you deal with the the tensions of sort of the demands of the institution while doing that? What is obviously deeply spiritual work um, that you are being willing to do that have no metrics or things to that you can tell them when they ask where's your research? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good question. Thanks, Barbara. Um, and I'm glad that you asked it because it's such a balancing act, you know. We um storytellers, especially recently, and people like you and Kosi Kaba and and Diana Ferris and, and certain other people have come to the realization that there's a pretense within academia to accept a different kind of knowledge production and to accept a different kind of scholarship, but it's only a pretense. When it comes down to the bottom line, you still have to fill in the Excel spreadsheet. You still have to do 4B302. You still have to have a process that is designed for a different kind of knowledge production. And so on a personal level, what I've done is the first few years as a professor of practice at, at UJ, I accepted their understanding of my role and I responded to it and it almost killed me. And so then I realized that I can't do this. I either have to give up this teaching, but I love the teaching, or I have to make the institution understand that I can work with them differently. And so we came to a compromise and compromise in, in, a, in a tangible sense works in that I only teach for half a year, so I'm only required to be there for half a year. And for the rest of the year, I can write and do my creative processes because it's extremely difficult to speak to my ancestors in the morning and, and respond to what I'm being guided to do and then get out of that and run to UJ and, you know, and sit behind my computer and have seminars with the professors. Um, so, but at the same time, the contradiction here is that we need to, part of what we also need to do is to drag these in institutions, willing or unwilling, into a different way of being. Because you cannot be an African institution in the 21st century and be pale colonials, you know. You can't still be imitating that way of doing things. I understand that certain, certain disciplines um, have different requirements, but especially in the humanities, um, I feel that humanity should be leading the way. And in a way, I'm extremely comfortable at UJ because UJ is trying really hard and succeeding in, in a lot of different areas to become a, a more African university, to, to be truly committed to, to decolonizing. But at the same time, I kind of see it as my, as part from having struck a, a sweet deal with them to work only half the time. Um, and get paid for all the time. Um, I, I still, I see it as my, as part of my responsibility, having accepted to be inside that institution, to to find ways of opening it up to a different way of thinking. And I think the, the way you do that, and, and I'm sure you found this, is you almost have to play the game up to a point and write in a certain way, tell stories in a certain way that is not just accessible to the people out there that I think is important to reach, but that's also accessible to people in academia who want to see things packaged in a certain way, you know. So um, I think this experience last week was 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 very typical of what, what we're talking about here. So the one minute, there we are on a farm in Philippi having a very sacred ceremony that is the epitome of connecting with the natural world and all its chaos, you know. There's a goat being slaughtered, there's shit being pushed out of the goat's insides, there's blood in a bowl and people putting their feet in the blood and, and there's fires being lit and people putting ash in their faces. Now, if I took those images and, and I, I filmed a lot of it, and most of it I would never show publicly because the, unless they are shown in a very, very specific context, it's damaging and you lose it. Um, but if I put that, the knowledge I gained from that, what I was getting powerfully and firsthand for use in the kind of work that I'm doing was extremely powerful and I could never get anywhere else. But how do you bring that kind of 
waterfall of knowledge injection into a space like this. This space was far too clinical. It's cold. It's devoid of art and spirit. And how do you bring all that in here? You know, if you just bring the video, you're a mess. <laughs> and so, so it's just bringing those things closer to each other because the 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 African knowledge systems um, have a lot to gain from somehow trying to find a way of working with, not within, but with these knowledge systems. And these knowledge systems have much more to gain from not just observing in that old fashioned scholarly way, but becoming part some of, of what is, is happening out there. And, and, and people like us, the people in this room, the storytellers that, that we, we both know so well, are the connectors between these worlds, you know, because they, they, there has to be a bridge from the problematic past to a much better future. And people who are the connectors can have all those bridges. Thank you so much, uh, Prof, for your response. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Yes, just a thank you, Agnes. Let me run up that one of them. But I, I think I just wanted to say thank you for, for how you were so brave with the boundaries of what might be conceived as traditional scholarship, especially when it comes to the strength that you are. And so, aesthetics of knowledge production in the economy. I mean, when you tell a story about about um, coming from Dakar uh, and coming there and seeing it at uh, Samoma and writing about that, I, I think for me that was that was interesting in terms of um, how you know, it moves us into a series of questions about contemporary South Africa, but it's like I have unresolved questions, yeah. you know, that seem to be. And I think at the center of the, the contestation, I think it would be a very interesting. And then you know, it's, it's, it's fundamental human questions about, about colonialism, its, it's implications, but also what we haven't confronted um, as a people. You know? And it seems that that's, what's, that's something we hold here, you know, that that, 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 that we think is uh, and, you know, something has to be done. You know? So thank Absolutely. Thank, thank you for that. And that continuity is so important because we know as, as Africans that we can we see it in our daily lives. If there isn't a continuity between the world, the, the, the guidance of our ancestors and the lives that we live, if there isn't a continuity between the past and, and the present, the people who's, on whose shoulders we are standing, then our lives are disjointed and broken and problematic. And when we and of course, we'd never ever achieve that seamless continuity. We never achieve that balance, but we have to constantly strive to get that balance because it just, you know, it just it, it, it leads to a whole existence that where we can just function at our optimum selves rather than functioning as half humans. Thank you so much. I Okay, can I just uh, mention, uh, normally we finish the, the book session at two o'clock, but for the purpose of this engagement, we should extend it, I suppose, for another uh, 30 minutes. We can, end, we can end on or before 2.30. Um, I see two hands in the room. Should there be another uh, hand in the chat, please let us know. Uh, I saw your hand. Can she go first? Okay. Really, I'm grateful. It's one of the ways in the world. And I'm just following the house in the last week. I am a qualified woman. I've been working with medicinal herbs for years now. I can't almost 30 years now, but I can't explain in words, in words what happened over the last week. I know that my work is not done. I know that our people need their land. I know that in Africa, we have all the natural alternatives to the pharmaceuticals that they try to kill our people with. So I'm ready for work. I'm ready for the work that needs to be done. I'm not here to talk about my experience. I'm ready for the work.
because we have all the herbs here. Why are people being, why is all of these things still happening to the First Nation? I could never understand. My father comes from India. My mother's family comes from Malaysia. But I know that I come from, yeah. So there's a lineage along the line and the work needs to be done now. That's what happened to me over this week. Our people don't have land. I read an article the other day where they say they um pushing out Caucasians and they're pushing out the so-called colors to make way for BE. Five, what did they say? Half a million people are going to lose their jobs. I read that article in the report the other day. These things need to stop. I'm ready for the work. And that is the message Kritoa gave me. Thanks so much for your comment. Yeah, I just have a very quick question, bro. Thank you so much. Um, I was um, I was wondering if you could perhaps share a bit about how you felt and you finished up with kind of what kind of effective stage you got to with this kind of physical illness was there in the beginning for the idea of kind of Moving, they started to write. I think, yeah. How did you feel when you thought that the birds too much? That's a very good way of describing it, because there was there was that feeling of something that I'd been carrying, you know, and that that was now out there. And I was actually thinking about that yesterday. I was I was going through some of the things that I'd, I'd like to say. At, this um, event today, and and I was thinking back on that time, and the, the it was like me looking back at myself as a different person. I just felt like I had been completely, and I know this is a cliche, been kind of reborn. But I, please, I hate that word because it's such a cliche, and and then so. There was there was a feeling of starting something, of being new in a way. And and what was interesting was after having um, spent some time with the women last week who were going through the now ceremony, and after the slaughtering of the goat, and I got home and I I did a kind of ending off for myself, um, doing a, a, a wash, but also doing ritual wash with herbs and things. I had some of that feeling again. Of, of kind of this this newness and starting over, and and so when when the, the book was out there, I also had a period where I was completely in awe of what it was because I didn't understand it. The the sort of small intellectual me didn't get it, you know. And then when I saw these these reactions and the feedback I was getting and what people were saying to me, I didn't even expect people to understand what. It meant. Um, I understood that the book was like a child. It came through me, but it wasn't. It wasn't mine. It wasn't. It was of me, but not me. And and so so those understandings and post writing the book just led me to be more and more open to hear more and more clearly how things work between that world and this world. And, and that led me through a, a, a period, the book came out in 2016. In 2017, I had this experience with a bird and then my mother died. And then um, in 2018, I had another ancestral experience of being taken up into some place that is beyond this place. And then the Kotoba play happened. And, and so each time there's this, learning and teaching and experience on a spiritual level for the next thing um 
and and the next bit of growth and but all started with this point and with with the writing of this book it was also a powerful indication for myself to my ancestors to say yes i'm available for this because what has happened here a lot of what has happened here especially in this part of africa is that completely disconnect complete disconnect from the past and from ancestral guidance um and i don't really like saying this but a lot of people feel that it is at, at loggerheads with their religious spirituality or with the with the, the faith that they follow. And so you have this general disconnect, lack of guidance. And it might not be your child that is involved in drugs or your child that is an alcoholic or whatever, but the, the social dysfunction is huge mm -hmm. as a, a as a result of this disconnect from who we really are. And it's not just who we are on a kind of ethnic or tribal level or the level of being Kwekwe or San, Italian, Zulu or whatever. It's a very deep disconnect from who we are on a spiritual level. So much, Prof. Thank you, Nina. for the question. Does anyone have a comment or reflection? I have a a burning comment I believe. <laughs> Maybe it's not a, a question, but it might be just a reflection of your of your, your your presentation and your book. And I I think what struck me is um uh, a few terms demarcation, Usman Kind, primitivity, um how the language, social dysfunction which you've just mentioned. And um I think my own reflection is, is just the challenge or the problematic nature of what demarcation can bring to uh, the surface of the place and this place that is now multi-layered with, you know, you had the ancestral base, now multi-layered with modernity, buildings and, and things like that, leading to what I think is improvisation of, of rituals. Speaking about the Kratoa ritual, I'm wondering, what, improv what improvisation might you have to do in order to keep that ritual going? Okay. And I say this because where I come from in Matville and South, we improvise in many ways for baby rituals or for any other rituals because of modernity, because of the layers on top of our ancestral land. And uh, you spoke about this um, ritual at Filippi, uh, construct that is birthed from Povurts apartheid government township, modernity. How might that improvisation play out um, in Philippi when you're undertaking the Kratoa ritual? Um, and I'm also reflecting on a very, my first initiation to anthropology was when I watched a, a Kalahari family. You were, maybe you know it by John Marshall, since you have some film background. Anyway, it's a, it's a five part documentary series on uh, the Junkwasi uh, family in, in uh, Namibia. And he takes us through 50 years of what uh, colonial contact and domication uh, can do to bring forth what you call social dysfunction. You see over the course of 50 years how the Jutwasi evolved from uh, uh, what I would characterize as hum a harmonized society to society that's struggling with modernity, society that's struggling to maintain their rituals or rhythms that you also mentioned in your talk. Um, the inner rhythms, the beating drums that are impacted on by new rhythms of the colonial entry, new rhythms of that vehicle that pulls the tracks into their, 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 their grasslands. So for me, that's like, a, I guess what I'm pointing at is a complexity of demarcation, a complexity of um, how the imposition of, of coloniality and the layers that kind of lead us to improvise with respect to language, um, you said that the Kwao language is also extinct. And I'm wondering whether there are other dialects that might be um, remnants from there that are surviving. What is, what is it that people are doing to improvise with the terms? Is it really extinct? Um, how are people trying to improvise to keep it alive? Um, I just have all these things in my head. I'm a bit of an overthinker, sorry. <laughs> I appreciate where you're going with all of that, and I, I followed it um, with, with great interest that 
demarcations, the improvisation, the language, the the the, the ritual being done in a place, Philippi, the context of Philippi. So I'm going to start with the context of Philippi, which I think is important and help us to get to to other points. And that is um, for those of you who know um, this part of of the Cape. Philippi is interesting. It's not a township. It is a series of farms and small holdings. It's it's the it's the Philippi aquifer. So there is a rich water source there, and it's traditionally been the the kind of vegetable garden of of the Cape Peninsula. And so there are these small farmers growing growing fresh produce there. But in the middle of that, um, um, Sister Glenda has started a has made her homestead available for these traditional rituals. And yes, I, I suspect there is a lot of improvisation, like um, Omalena was, was guiding things because Omalena is our direct connection with um, part of our, our history that in, in the Cape has been a lot, a lot of which has been lost. And so she was making sure that certain things were done in a certain way and was done according to tradition. But on that point of improvisation, I just want to say, yes, there are certain things that have to be done in a certain way because it's important, but culture is a living dynamic thing. It changes all the time. And these, these rituals and, and um, um, disciplines and things that we, that we practice, you know, came from somebody's improvisation. So it is much better to improvise and keep something alive and keep those glowing embers of our culture alive. And with the improvisation, we can fan those embers into flames that, we, that can sustain us. And, and it is much better to do that than to get too hung up on the dogma of a thing. And the dogma of a thing is very uh, um, typical of certain kinds of mainstream religions where that cup with that inscription means that, and it must be used like that from left to right and placed in that way. And then we lose the divinity of the thing. And, and, and divinity and create, cre creation is dynamic and changing and complex. And so we must respond to the dynamism and the complexity of the universe with the innovation, because after all the innovation is inspired by the divine most of the time. When our intentions are correct, and in this case, our intentions are to honor Kretoa and to give her the proper now, but also to give her a burial. I think something Omalena said to me repeatedly on Saturday when we would, before we were doing the ritual and after, she said, I feel like I was at a funeral. And because that's exactly what we were doing, we were paying her that honor finally. She died alone, unattended, no ritual on Robin Island. She didn't have her traditional woman, a young woman ceremony. So we did those two things. And we did it in the way with the best intention, in the way that we know her. And that was enough to honor her. And yes, we should have those discussions, but was it right to, to slaughter the boat in this way and not that way? Yes, we should have those discussions, but we should not ever let it become the dogma that guides us. Mm -hmm. Can I say something? It, it should be the thing stopping you from continuing. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So much. Um, yes, I think we must all run. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming to the um, Keith, could I invite you to? Uh, um, please, could I invite you to uh, our next seminar, which is happening on Wednesday, the twenty fourth of May? Um, that is with Natasha Shebe, right, um, presenting on writing intellectual history. And I'm um, not sure if there's a, is there a, a, an entire seminar on Thursday? Has it been confirmed yet? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have an entire seminar on Thursday, the 25th, with uh, Andrew Sutherland, uh, who will speak about transforming Stellenbosch University. So you're more than welcome. Please check our website for more updates and our social media as well. And um, I would welcome you to our next semester's uh, seminars, as this is our final week of seminars at Humor.
Thank you so much. And you can get a copy of the book online. It's on, on Amazon, the Cape of the Kum. Um, there's a student discount if you want a copy now. And um, yeah, if you want a copy and you're not a student, um, in both cases, you can do an EFT. And I'm quite happy not to, to have to do that. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you all.